Today on Muscle Car, work on the Copal Camaro conversion continues as we put a spring in your step. Well, in your backside anyway, as the guys show you how to repair a ragged old busted up seat frame. Then we show you how to save 600 bucks by converting your steering column from auto to manual. Flashback looks at another piece of Camaro royalty, then learn how to fix a plastic grill. Hey guys, nice to see you. Today we're going to continue working on our 69 Copo Tribute Camaro. And the time has come for us to start doing some upholstery work. We've decided to try and save our original seat frames, but we're obviously going to change the padding and the coverage because they're a little worse for wear. Now our original seat frames are going to need some repair work and we'll get to that in just a second. But first we had to decide what we were going to cover our seats with. So we gave TMI Performance Interiors a call and they had exactly what we needed for our Camaro. And they have a whole lot of options, and all those options fit over stock seat frames. You have the choice of upgrading your seat padding to their Sport Seat, Sport Seat 2, and their Sport R models. These progressively increase the bolstering in the side of the seat, which in turn gives you a whole lot more support for performance applications. They also support the restoration market by offering stock style foam, seat covers in different colors, vinyls, and styles. And since deciding the look of your interior goes hand in hand with the way it's going to feel, the Sport R models can also be personalized with things such as custom colors, premium vinyl and unisuede inserts, as well as contrast stitching on the bolsters. The Copos came with a base interior, so that's the choice that we're going to make. Now just like Mank said, we've got to do a little repairing to our springs because they're in kind of bad shape. We've got a few of them that's broke, the frame's kind of jacked up, but it ain't nothing that's non-repairable. Now the first thing that we noticed, well our seat frame was broken where these two spot welds had just come loose. That stuff happens over time. We also noticed that the main frame wire had come unhooked from the frame and it needs to be like this one. Something else that we found, the side supports were broken on both sides of this thing, which is not no big deal, we we'll just have to take care of them. I'm going to start by drilling a couple of holes so that we can spot weld the frame back together. Then the main wire can be hooked back into place with the tab being knocked back down to hold it in. Then the tougher part of the repair begins. Sometimes these clips can be a little bit of a bear, but they're not supposed to let go of the wire. Now to replace our springs, we went to a local upholstery shop and just got some spring material. The stuff isn't really expensive and it's a must whenever you're doing this type of repair. Because you can't simply weld the springs together because it sprung steel. And once you weld it, it's going to crack on either side of the weld. You want to be careful with these tabs when you're putting them back into place. They've been known to break off before. Now the old clips that we took off, you could reuse them again, but heck, they make new ones. We just picked these up at the local upholstery shop where we got the new springs. This stuff is really and truly not all that expensive, so while you're there, just go ahead and pick up a few of these and get some extras just in case you kind of consume or waste a couple, if you know what I mean. Okay, with that done, now I've got to cut this excess off. Now, you could just cut it, but you're running a chance of where you snipped it coming back through on your upholstery. It needs to be bent back like this one here. So I'm going to use a torch and get it all hot so that I can pull it around and snip it off. And that also keeps it from slipping out of this clip. Well, there you go. That pretty much got our seat frame all repaired. Now all we have to do is install the foam followed by the upholstery, and this thing will be ready to set in the car. And yes, we'll let the frame cool off before we start putting the foam and material over top of it. So don't send me any angry emails, please. Well, there you go, guys. We've had us what you would call a seat makeover. The springs are all stiff, the foam feels good, and when riding in this thing, it's not going to feel like you're sitting on the floorboard. So spend your little time and get yourself a set of these seats. Stick around to see how you can save big bucks on a column conversion. Then it's a small block sizzler and a plastic grill fix that you can do at home. For the most part, our interior is just about finished up in our Copo tribute car. Mr. Mank over here has got our original automatic column that come out of our Camaro. 
It's not in too bad of a shape, but with the four speed from Auto Gear that's going to propel our car, we certainly don't have any need for an automatic shifter up on the column. The bad news is a new factory style column can run you close to 700 bucks, but there is some light at the end of the tunnel. This column here has all the components needed to swap that automatic column back over to the manual floor shift style. And the best part is this baby only cost us a hundred bucks. You mean cost me a hundred bucks. Build on a budget. Muscle car projects that save you time and money. Well, Mr. Mank, I'm going to let you kind of fiddle faddle with these steering columns because I've got a little bit of work to do on the Camaro. Good luck with it. May the power be with you and all that mushy stuff. First, we'll get rid of a bunch of easy stuff to remove, like the hazard knob and the shift lever, followed by the upper column mount bracket, which only has a few bolts. Then the steering wheel has to come off. Trying to do this without a steering wheel removal tool is way more hassle than it's worth. So if you can get your hands on one of these, removers are well worth it. There's also another tool for removing the lock sprocket. And yes, you'll want this too. The good news is that both of these are cheap and often you can borrow one. The next piece to come out is the horn contact then the bearing and the retainer. That will let us get the turn signal cam assembly out. We're in the home stretch now, and a few small bolts come out which hold the upper housing on the column. At this point, the steering shaft assembly is ready to come out. Then with a few taps of the hammer, we can remove the shifter collar. That's it, that's the piece we need to switch. Then guess what? Now the whole process has to be repeated on the old column. Mm. Old parts like this, as you know, have a tendency to decide that they prefer the company of one another, and it makes it hard to get them apart. The good news is we've seen how it comes apart once already on the other column. All right, now that you guys had to watch that painful display of me tearing apart two old steering columns, here's what we were chasing. Our original column in the car was an automatic with the selector up on the column itself. We're going to eliminate that because we're going to have the car with the four-speed system, which means we wanted to get rid of this tower here and make it smooth. This is the correct one we need. It's smooth all the way around and is the correct piece for a floor shift car, whether it was an automatic with a console or a four-speed. And as long as we're this far apart, I'm going to go ahead and replace the tumbler and key unit inside the column. A helpful hint for you guys, when you're doing it, you're going to find a tab down inside this slot here in the column that has to be compressed. It's hidden and it's a little bit of a pain in the butt, but you need to do this to get it out of the unit itself or it will not be that easy. Well, I've got this thing tore apart as far as I want to take it down. This thing still has some mechanical parts in it and they're working well, so I'm going to leave them be and clean this piece by hand. But we're going to take these two pieces and some of the other smaller ones and put them in a blasting cabinet, clean them up and repaint them so they're ready to go. With a coat of black duplicolor trim paint on the parts, reassembly can begin on our column. While we had it apart, we also made sure that all the bearings were clean as well as re-greasing them. Installing a new ignition tumbler is pretty simple. It's just a matter of pushing it into place. This little copper contact is the ground for the horn, and it has to be properly seated before the signal cam goes back in. Well, there you go. For the most part, our column is finished and ready to go. We had to do a little tedious work, but we did save ourselves several hundred dollars by doing so. We're going to get ready to put it in the car, but I'm going to leave the top off in case we have to make any adjustments to the tumbler or in case we have to do any circuit testing once everything's hooked back up in the car itself. We'll be good to go. Next, we've got a pony car bruiser for you that tested a man's brand loyalty. Today's flashback, a 1969 Camaro Z28 Rally Sport.
For car fanatics, brand loyalty can be something of a religion. But sometimes, love can make you do crazy things. Larry White was a true blue Ford man until a pretty little lady caught his eye. When we first started dating, I had a 1970 Ford Mach 1. And then every time I'd show up to her house, pick her up on a date, her, her dad would rag me about having a Ford. So I finally broke down and, and decided to buy a Chevrolet to appease him. And I bought a 69 Z28 Camaro, hug her orange, just like this one. I actually learned how to drive a stick shift in that car. And we used to fight over who was gonna drive. <laughs> Specifically designed for Trans Am racing, it combines small block performance with road hugging agility, earning it the nickname, The Hugger. The exclusive powerhouse was a Turbo Fire 302, designed to meet the 305 cubic inch limit of the road course series. Chevy started with a 327 block and threw in a 283 crankshaft, a solid lifter cam, and L79 327 heads. Rated at a mere 290 horsepower, it actually produced upwards of 400, propelling it from 0 to 60 in just 7.4 seconds. It was all topped off with a cowl induction hood wearing some rally stripes. To handle the demands of the road course, Z28s came loaded with heavy duty suspension, front disc brakes, quick ratio steering, and a 12 bolt posse rear end. Oh yeah, and a her shifter. That was mandatory. This Z28 also got the Rally Sport treatment, which was basically an appearance package. There was more chrome all around, plus a blacked out grille with some slick concealed headlights. The tail panel was unique, with the backup lights moved down below the bumper. Inside this car is all dressed up with Indy Pace Car upholstery and wood grain trim. Rally gauges came mounted on the dash and in the console. A fold down seat also allows for a little extra storage. Camaro's got a subtle makeover in 69 to give them a more aggressive stance. The grill was now V-shaped, and the wheel wells and body panels were more squared off. Simulated vent moldings were added in front of the rear wheels. The first Z28s appeared in 67, but flew under the radar, and only about 600 were sold. In 69, more than 20,000 rolled out of the dealers. Larry had to get rid of his original Z to put himself through college. It may be long gone, but this restored one has done a good job taking its place. Every time we get in this car, it's like we're going back in time. <laughs> it's like we're out on a date again. Still ahead, we do a grill repair that rescues your factory front. Hey guys, I'm to a point that I kind of need to take a break from doing all that wet sanding and buffing on the Camaro, so I decided might as well get started on repairing the grill. We got a couple of gnarly spots, but luckily for us, they are repairable. The first step we're going to move into is removing the trim off of it because we're going to end up having to paint this thing. Might as well get it out of the way. Just kind of wiggle this stuff off. Don't put a whole lot of pressure on it because you don't really want to tweak this stuff it's a bear to try to straighten back out. Here's another little tip for you. If you're taking things apart, put them back together. I know it sounds pretty simple, but this way, if it's already back together, you can't forget how it goes back together. To make the repair, we're gonna use this two-part epoxy. Now, if you were working and trying to repair a grill that was far more busted up than the one that we're working on, they actually make a webbing or netting style material that you can use for the more serious repair. This stuff works as a structural component to make the repair a lot stronger. This particular epoxy is designed for plastic repair, which makes it suitable for what we're trying to do. Now we're ready to move on to the sanding side. I'm gonna use this custom sanding block that I made, which is actually just an old stir stick with a groove cut in it and a piece of 80 grit. Now before I go to sanding, I'm gonna take my knife and kind of trim this edge off a bit. And the reason I'm gonna do that instead of wrapping the sandpaper around is that whenever I go to sand, I'll be removing material from this edge and that edge. And I don't wanna remove any from that side. You may have noticed while I'm sanding this, I'm actually not sanding it flat against this surface because I'm trying to add a taper to this repair. That way, whenever I put my filler in there, it broadens the surface. Instead of just being right on this edge, it's actually down past it a bit. Now I need to build me a form so that whenever I put this stuff in there, it won't just flop over. So I'm gonna take this paint paddle, trim it down a bit, see if that'll work. 
Now it might surprise a few of you out there to know that I've tried my hand at whittling and about the only thing that I know that I can make is kindling. That one will work. Now before you start applying the epoxy onto your repair, it's a good idea to squirt out a decent amount to ensure that the stuff is mixed properly. I know that's a little excessive, but I can come back and trim it and shape that stuff. There it goes. And there we go. I'll use a knife to trim away the bulk of the excess because it helps to cut down on the sanding time. We still need to do some sanding and we'll go through several grits to get it smoothed out. I'm also going to use a dab of glazing putty to get it nice and straight. Now all we got to do is spray on some primer, do a little bit of sanding, and then paint this thing black to match the rest of our Camaro. Now if you're working on a grill that has several more broken spots, you got to do the math whether it's worth repairing or not. They do offer a new grill for the Camaro, but for the material that we spent, it's less than 20 bucks. If you're working on a car that they don't offer one, well, that's probably really and truthfully your only option is to repair it. So just spend a little time, get some kind of primitive tools, give it a shot. If you've got any questions about anything you saw on the show today, go over to PowerBlockTV.com.